it was reviewed by a Pākehā and the reviewer said that he had not come across a Māori that like the one that I was playing. And I thought, well, you probably haven't come across a lot of Māori. And I remember a lot of Māori um, were, they found it hard as well. And the thing that was difficult was Māori weren't on screen. New Zealanders were hardly on screen then, but for Māori to be on screen. And so I played this guy who was street sharp, um, who was willing to play the dumb Māori in order to get the upper hand of his flatmate. And that was, you know, that was me thinking intellectually about the role. And, you know, so I, I spoke like this and, and, you know, our ear, our television ear has become used to that Māori accent now. But n at that stage, nobody had, had heard that. And I chose a country accent rather than a city Māori accent, which was slightly different. I remember going back up to Auckland and a cousin of mine coming up to me in the pub and he, and he said, oh, how come you talk like that? You make us sound dumb. We don't talk like that, Al. And, um, and to me, what that said was that we aren't used to hearing our own voice. And so I thought, oh, well, that's fine, you know, and I can, I can take that heat. Um, and, and I had a ball with it, really. I had a small role. I was in one episode and I played the governor's valet. When my character, I don't even, can't even remember his name, um, the valet, when he died, they had quite a big setup with a track and I was being dragged along with, with a big long track and Muxlow was directing. And um, I got the, the great note and it was a big setup and had to be pulled along. It was a big rehearsal and, um, and we did it and everybody was happy with the first go, and, you know, and they, they called cut. And yes, picture happy, everyone happy, sound happy, everybody was happy. But Muxlow wasn't happy and he came down and he knelt beside me and he said, um, Rawiri, could you pull it back? And I looked at him and I thought, because I was dead. And I said, how, how can I pull it back? I'm dead. <laughs> so that was, you know, that was probably a bit too theatrical. Any actor that can be asked to pull it back when he's dead is, is doing too much. I loved it. I loved doing it. I loved the, the people in it. And, um, and it, was a, it was a high profile. And as I was doing it, I realised, because they repeated these programmes for many years to come, and I realised then, I thought, this is actually um, going to make me being used to an audience that's going to last for years. And I knew that at the time, and I thought, this is not a dumb career move. And, you know, and, and I was an actor, and I knew I'd get other acting work, and people were going, why are you going to Dunedin and why are you doing play school? And I said, just you wait and see. And, and um, you know, I still get, I still go around. The, unfortunately, the people that come up to me now are now in their 40s. And <laughs> but, you know, it was, it was a great fun show. And, and again, the political side in me was able to happen. We we fought for the right to say kia ora and we got some Māori content in there and, um, and, and that was good as well. I got there and there were like four lines of dialogue and I thought, what's this? And so I did a whole lot of improv stuff and that's the way that Rangi got to be as big as it was in the film. It was a really, really small role in one scene. But we just um, mucked around with you know, with in in the set because there's only you in there, and it was a novel experience for me. It's I think it's my only experience at animation, and um, and it was great fun. And you know, I, we had a few beers in the studio in Parnell where we did it. I think, and um, and I just had a ball playing this young kid who um, who, like any young kid in New Zealand, saw himself as an All Black. The producers liked my voice as the kid so much that they were having trouble with the voice for um, for the dog. 
and they um, actually wanted to have a go to see if I could do both voices. And they were really keen on that idea, but I couldn't differentiate the two. And they didn't want to lose me as Rangi, but I would love to have had a go at the dog too. <laughs> it's a small role, actually, the, the role in that film. He's in about eight scenes. And, um, but he has, a, he has a, a big impact because he's very, very different in, to a lot of the other gang characters. And, and he's different because of what he's going through. And, and I love that, that complexity, you know, when an actor gets that kind of challenge, they just go, yeah. One of the things that I felt about Muller was that he was not happy at being a Māori and he was not happy about his elders and it's his elders. And I, I decided that he had definitely been abused as a kid, sexually abused and violently abused and by his elders and so the Māori world didn't hold much stick for him and the Māori world that he would have grown up in would have grown up with all that great respect for the Māori battalion and so when he started to deface himself the first thing that he did I decided was a swastika and he put it right there and the purpose of that was to piss off his elders and I was Staying in a um, in a um, an apartment in in Queen Street, the bottom of Queen Street, and so I, I went back to the apartment and I thought I'm going to go for a walk in these tattoos and I put on some suitable gears. I'm going to walk up, not in character. I'm just going to walk just to see how what the reaction of the people was, and it was awesome because people avoided me. I went into shops and shop detectives followed me. Um, nobody, people averted their eyes. Um, people were instinctively frightened of me. And inside it was just me, you know. But I, it, it, was, a, it was a great bit of actor exercise for me to do. I decided what I loved about Koro was honesty. Um, he was an honest man. He was a fool as well, but he, is, he was foolish with his honesty as well. But he was an honest man and he honestly believed that his path had been set and that he needed to follow that path and could not veer from it. And that was an honest impulse. And so that's what I found in him that was lovable was his honesty. Standing on the beach when the girl supposedly disappears on the back of the whale. And it comes from working with Nikki, who is singly the most beautiful director I've ever worked with. And she pulled me aside and she said, this is the most humble moment of your entire life. And that was her direction, that's all she said. And I was on the beach, and of course there's no whale, there's no girl out there, it's all off camera and the, the camera's coming in. And I was on the beach, and there on the beach was a whole community that had been such a part of that film. And, and a magnificent crew with such a high level of expertise and a beautiful village, a, a, a utopia. And I thought, who am I to be in this situation right now? And it was really easy for me to feel incredibly humble. Um, and to convert that to my close-up when I looked out and, you know, there past the camera um, is is that beautiful girl who is the hero of that film and, and the magnificent actor who is Keisha Castle Hughes.